So hello, everyone. I would like, first of all, to thank my colleagues from CCRI for inviting me here this afternoon. Uh, for those of you who don't know me already, my name is Alessio Russo, and I'm the course leader for the Master in Landscape Ar Architecture. Um, let me start by just saying uh, a few words about what lectures do. So as you can see here, it is a, a busy life, uh, teaching, uh, service and research. Uh, so in today's presentation, I will talk about my current and past research projects. I hope that by the end of, the, of this talk, you'll be familiar with concepts such as uh, green infrastructure, uh, nature-based solutions, ecosystem services, edible green infrastructure. Uh, so as a researcher, research can impact your everyday life. So it is important to engage with um, practice as well to inform policy makers and city managers. In the past, I have been involved in engaging with policy makers um, in several countries. Here I was in, in China, as you can see, it was before the pandemic. Um, next slide. Um, this picture is with uh, Jerry Brown. Uh, who is the former governor of California. Um, this was a uh, roundabout about climate change. And here I'm in India with the former chief minister of Rajasthan. So you can see it's a smart city. So um, I would like you to think about the current societal challenges, uh, such as population growth, climate change, food security, and disaster risk, air pollution, and health, for example, now COVID. In addition, we are the generation of the homo urbanus. This is because 68% of the world's population will live in cities. So, which approaches or strategies can we use to make cities more sustainable, more resilient, and how we can address all the societal challenges? This timeline shows ecological urban planning and design concept. So starting from 1960, so we can see that in 1960, uh, we had this book, uh, Design with Nature by Jan McCark, uh, the concept of green wages, green waste. In the 1970s, we have the concept of sustainability, 1980s, uh, biophilia, 1990s, we have uh, the concept of uh, urban regeneration, re regenerative design. And only in, in 2000, we talk about ecological systems, uh, social ecological system and green infrastructure. So I would like to look at the green infrastructure in a, more bit, uh, in a bit more detail. Um, as you can see here, the literature on the green infrastructure is vast. Uh, there are almost 3 million results in Google Scholar. But this concept was used only in 1994, as you can see here. So what is a green infrastructure? Um, so the, I would like to stress that connectivity is a key for green infrastructure. For example, the European Union defines green infrastructure as a strategically planned network of natural and semi-natural areas with other environment future design and managed to deliver a wide range of ecosystem services. So we will discuss ecosystem services later. 
On the other hand, we have also this concept of uh, green ways, uh, the different green infrastructure in three ways, as you can see here. So green infrastructure emphasizes ecology, not recreation. Green infrastructure includes ecological important hubs as well as uh, key landscape linkages. And uh, finally, uh, green infrastructure can be designed to shape urban form and provide a framework for growth. But nowadays we have this new concept, nature-based solution. This article was published in Nature in 2017. So nature-based solution is, is the latest gr uh, green jargon that means more than you might think. Um, as you can see here, the nature-based concept is increasingly being developed and applied by the International Union for Conservation of Nature and other organizations such as the European Commission. So here you, we can see this other timeline. So we can see that for the first time, the International Union for Conservation of Nature used uh, the term nature-based solutions all in 2002. In 2005, we had the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And in um, 2010, we had the, the Natural Solution Report. In 2014, there was the Biodiversity uh, Nature-Based Solution Workshop. And, and here, as you can see, 2015, 2016 to nowadays, Nature-based solution at the core of EU research and innovation program. As you can see here, nature-based solution renaturing cities. Um, so, what type uh, nature-based solution? So there are uh, several definitions. Uh, so here you can see this definition from Cohen uh, Shakam. I don't know how to pronounce, but they say that. Uh, Nature-based solutions use ecosystem and the services they provide to address societal challenges such as climate change, food security, or natural disaster, disasters. And then we have the uh, definition from the International Union for Conservation uh, of Nature and the European Commission definition. So here you can see the difference. So here you can see um, in bold that here you can see the difference is action to protect sustainable, sustainably manage and restore natural modified ecosystem. And here you can see living solutions inspired by using nature. So here we don't see the, the link, the connectivity that we had in the uh, green infrastructure uh, definition. But in both definition, we have ecosystem services. So if you don't know what, what ecosystem services are, ecosystem services are the benefits that humans obtain from uh, ecosystem. And it's important, uh, ecosystem services are, are important because human health and well-being depend on ecosystem goods and services, according to Professor Costanza. And this is from uh, uh, scientific reports. So health benefits from nature experience, experience depends on those. So we say an apple day keeps the doctor away. I say that the long visit to green spaces a day uh, keeps the doctor away. So this should be uh, our way to think uh, and also our daily behavior. So every day we should take a shower, but also we should take a forest buffing. Um, so there is this book from Professor Lee about the, the benefits of a forest buffing. And as you can see here in this meta-analysis, you can see the health benefits of the great outdoors. So if we, if we are planning for sustainable communities, we need ecosystem services. And at the same time, we will have human health and well-being. 
So on this image, you can see all the server ecosystem services provided by green and blue infrastructure. So you can see regulation of microclimate, noise reduction, food production that we will uh, talk later, carbon storage sequestration, habitat provision, runoff retention, water filtration, recreational and cultural values, and air purification. And this is from all the uh, European um, Commission uh, report about nature-based solution, all the benefits. Uh, so you can see here increased resilience, decreased urban heat stress, uh, ensure well-functioning ecosystem. And uh, as you can see here, this is from a European project, transforming cities, enhancing well-being, innovating with nature-based solutions. So four principal goals that have been identified that can be addressed by nature-based solution. The first one is enhancing sustainable urbanization, restoring degraded ecosystem, developing climate change adaptation and mitigation. And the last one is improving risk management and resilience. So uh, let's now look at this slide, which is a literature review uh, on this new concept. So if you want to find uh, more about uh, this different concept, green infrastructure, you can read this publication from my friend Francisco Escobedo and colleagues. And, and recently, uh, Professor Randrap and colleagues have stated that we should also um, use more sustainable approaches. So he said that we should call for a nature-based thinking, as you can read here. So this is my part about a nature-based solution. And now I want to ask you if you ever had, uh, um, how many of you ever, ever heard the concept of edible green infrastructure? So this is from my paper that was published in uh, 2017. Uh, so edible green infrastructure is a sustainable plant network of edible food components and structure within, uh, uh, within the urban ecosystem, which are managed and designed to provide primarily uh, provisional ecosystem services. So I wrote several papers on uh, also on edible urbanism, um, edible green infrastructure for urban regeneration and food security. So we have case study from uh, the Campania region where I'm, I'm from. So I don't have enough time to, to go into uh, detail about these projects. Uh, and also recently we published this paper about edible urban commons for resilience uh, neighborhoods in light of the pandemic, so edible green infrastructure and the current pandemic. And also other colleagues are using this concept of uh, nature-based solution and urban agriculture. So this was a, a paper that was published um, recently from colleagues from uh, Australia. Um, the other issue is how we can assess ecosystem services. Um, so there is a need for accurate tools that can measure and value ecosystem services, while at the same time should inform the community and city manager. So in recent years, several line tools have been developed to assess ecosystem services. However, the reliability of such tools depends on the incorporation of local or regional data and site specific inputs. So I have used several of, uh, of these tools like EnviMed. So here you can see uh, I assess the potential temperature in um, a streetscape in, um, in Italy, in Bolzano. So you can see uh, different scenarios, one with vegetation and one without vegetation. So we can, we can quantify the benefits uh, from uh, uh, nature-based solutions. 
Um, and also uh, I have assessed uh, different tools. Uh, for example, this is uh, uh, three different tools that is, is, is uh, local allometric equation, local data, uh, an American tool that is the three carbon calculator and the U4. So this is related to carbon sequestration. Yeah, and then you can see that the different models uh, provide uh, different results. And this is uh, a recent research that we just submit a month ago. Here is in the UK, is in Bristol. Um, so is to use the i3 tool, um, also using local data, the version that the, the, the recent 2021 version that has local data. Then we compare with the uh, 6.1 that use an average average data from the states and also we compare with the the UK average so we can you can also see here uh, also different uh, version different uh, results and um, here you can see is another comparison using the office for national statistics and the i3 tool so using the office for national statistics and the local data in, um, in Bristol. So you can see again, uh, different results. Uh, so um, which one we should use? Uh, so as, as um, George Box said, essentially all models are wrong, but some, but some are useful. So, my recommendation is to use models or tools that are using um, local data, so that are incorporating lot of, uh, local data. Um, and the other aspect is also the scale. The scale is very important in ecosystem services assessment. So this was a, a paper that uh, we published in uh, two, three months ago. And is in, uh, in Cheltenham. Uh, so we assess the, the ecosystem services at the uh, local scale. So as you can, um, so I would like uh, I would like you to focus your attention on this um, image. So here you can see the the ecosystem service. So uh, air purification, carbon storage noise reduction, runoff retention, cooling, recreation. Uh, so in this, uh, in this study, but also in several studies, we see that in the peri-urban, we have uh, uh, more ecosystem services. So we have always a, a gradient from um, peri-urban or the rural area to the core city. And this is an issue um, because you see that uh, at the core of the city, we don't have uh, enough ecosystem services. But on the other hand, there are uh, new urbanists that are using this approach, the approach of the transect. So they like to divide uh, an area in, like a transect so with different uh, specific characters. So they like to, to have uh, in this transect, that is a section, we, they will like to have a, a natural zone, a rural zone, a suburban zone, a general urban zone, and the urban center zone and urban court zone. So what is the, so here is um, all the characteristic characteristic of uh, all these uh, different areas. So uh, yes, looks nice. If you see nice drawings, uh, you say, wow, I would like to live in uh, such places. But when we look at the reality, we see that um, uh, in the suburban, like here, we can see, you know, a tree cover. I don't know what is the percentage of this tree cover, but then we will go to the urban core where we don't have uh, any vegetation. That means we will not have uh, 
any ecosystem services. And that is the area where, where we will have the majority of issues like the uh, urban heat island and, and um, pollutions. So I think this is the, the wrong approach. And we need to think uh, different approaches. So like now, um, this was uh, um, published in April. Uh, so that we must reward our city uh, for beauty, biodiversity, and also this new concept uh, of biophilic cities. Uh, so I, also the, there was this other paper from rewilding to forest schools. Our attitude to nature is changing for the better. And uh, so we have to think how we can um, incorporate um, ecology, nature-based solution in uh, city design planning. So I published um, this uh, book chapter um, well, last year, and here there are uh, several strategies uh, that you can use to design better and more sustainable uh, cities. Um, so how we can incorporate green infrastructure uh, within our urban environments? So we don't want that in the core city, we will have just buildings. We want to incorporate vegetation, green spaces, uh, one of uh, these approaches could be the biosphere research. So as you can see here, there are different approaches uh, for the biosphere. So the first one is the urban green belt biosphere reserve and urban green corridor biosphere research. So here you can see the corridor that is, as you can see, is a, is a link, is a connection, it's, 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 it's a green infrastructure. And then you have this urban green area with cluster biosphere reserve. And, and then you have this, the, the, this category, the number four, that is uh, urban region biosphere uh, reserve. So here is, is, a, is, is a, a region. At the same time, we had to think about um, ecosystem disservices. So when I'm talking about uh, ecosystem disservices, I'm talking about vegetables and soil contaminated by heavy metals and pollutants, uh, pollen allergies, volatile organic compounds, vox. Uh, if you have, uh, think about, you know, again, uh, green edible green infrastructure, urban agriculture, we should think about fruitful problems and water pollution from fertilizers and chemicals. And if you are thinking about uh, climate change, we should uh, think about water consumption. Uh, so um, people don't know that uh, um, plants produce box, why these uh, volatile organic compounds are, are important. Because as you can see on this image, they can produce the ozone, so sunlight plus nitrogen oxides plus box produce ozone, and then we will have in our city smog. So smog is a, is a problem in cities. And so we should um, we should select low vox emitter species. So it's very important to to select the right species in urban environments. And, and the other issue is, uh, is with allergy. Uh, so this is um, a graph in Bolzano where we conduct a study about al allergy. Uh, so for example, we found that uh, Zalkova was the most allergenic, but also depends, you know, if it's uh, males or females. So as you can see here, Archer Negundo, if it's a male, so produce pollen, you are the highest, and if it's female, it's, it's one. So it's also uh, this issue with uh, gender, so female, males. So it's, it's important to consider the, the allergy potential uh, when implementing 
tree planting strategies in cities. Um, so uh, it's important also that you consider the, the ecosystem services and at the same time the ecosystem the services. So in this paper, we we develop a ratio of ecosystem uh, services, these services using composite indicator to assess the net benefits of urban trees. And now let me see the, the time, yes. So now I want to ask you, I talk about nature-based solution. I talk about how that we should incorporate nature into our uh, urban environments. So looking at this image, do you think these, these are nature-based solution? You can use the chart. So do you think yes or no? I think it's necessary we can vote with hands, but uh, either hands up or down if that's required. No, it looks more like best kept village. So do you know this place? Not familiar to no, me. You, you tell us, Alessio. Yes, yeah, so this place is in Dubai. So, uh, you, so do you think this is sustainable? So yes, we can see flowers, we can see nature. So such solution can have some mental health benefits. But if you're thinking about climate change, Yes, I can see in Dubai, do this flower have enough water? Yes, they have enough water. Also, they are replacing uh, these plants every day. So think about the carbon emissions. So this is the miracle garden. Uh, yes, it's, it's nice to see, it's nice to visit, but what is the sustainability of the place? So uh, I think we need to, to discuss what is really nature-based solution. What is a, a real nature-based solution in terms of uh, sustainability? Uh, because because this is this is not the right approach. Um, so I work in Dubai, and uh, and now it's, it's only Abu Dhabi that are using um, uh, native species for. Uh, for the for the for streetscapes, but still, if you go to Dubai, you, you will see all these uh, marigolds and all these annual plants that uh, um, that uh, require water every day. Um, so, um, and so we we need to think that we need site-specific solutions. Uh, and also if you think uh, the, the grass, the lawn. So not in, in, in some countries it's not sustainable. So we need to, to think that not all uh, vegetation is sustainable in our cities. So now I'm writing um, a paper on rewilding and we are writing about what could be a more sustainable solution for our cities. So I, I think now I have enough uh, time for for questions. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Alessio, that's been really, really interesting and quite, um, I think, uh, thought-provoking uh, presentation, especially at the end. We have a couple of questions in the, um, in the chat. Uh, so the first one is, um, 
whether you and your peers use natural capital approaches to assess the benefit of green infrastructure um, because policymakers seems to like it. Yes, so just uh, I discussed this uh, this with um, Alex. I don't know if he's my uh, master students. Um, so so um, yesterday we 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 discussed about the, that that you know uh, some people like to give a prize for everything and ask to you know people how much you would like to to pay for. Um, uh, services so and so yeah I mean um, we have one student that is, is is also looking at this but um, you, you have to think that for example uh, I don't have a car because I live in Chelten in the, in the uh, city center so if somebody will ask me how much would would like to pay for this service. So for example, for a car, I would say, no, I don't need, perhaps I need more uh, public transportation because I'm using public transportation. Uh, so assessing um, natural capital and asking for people the willingness to pay, uh, this is, is, you know, is so individual. So some people, they are not, giving the right price to nature. So they don't understand the benefits of uh, green spaces. Uh, so I think people realize the benefits only, for example, last year when we had the national lockdown. So all the people there, they want to have a garden or want to, you know, to, to live next to a park. Um, so yes, this is, could be an approach just to influence policymakers and then the economical calculation, yes, there are also some limitations. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, um, there is a, one more question in the, um, in the chat. Um, uh, if some tree species produce ozone with wax, uh, would that help to uh, replenish the ozone uh, depleted from the atmosphere? So uh, there are several studies and also the I3 eco model can quantify um, vox emitted by species. And there is a paper from, uh, if I remember Benjamin, I think it was 1999 with the list of, uh, um, with different species. So uh, if, I, if I'm right, I think coniferous, so evergreen, they emit more uh, box, so we can yes we can that then depends also um, the the font of pollutants so because as you can see from my slides also you need uh, nitrogen oxides so if you don't have nitrogen oxides you don't have ozone so so you can have an a, an area where you have uh, high vox but if there is no the combination with nitrogen oxides uh you will not have smog you will not have ozone so the this is also another approach that we somehow uh we should separate you know also we we can we can solve uh, some uh issues with plants in cities but also we need to think about the public transportation so as i said also we need to think about a sustainable um um transportation. For example, I wrote a paper about um, carbon storage and sequestration and the carbon offset uh, for, from the CO2 from, um, from um, the transportation sector. And then we saw that the, the, the offset by by three urban trees is only 0.008%. So yes, uh, plants, they can offset emissions, but uh, you have to consider to change the, also to implement a better uh, public transportation system. So here is a, an interaction between uh, urban planners, urban forests, uh, landscape ar architects, because yes, with plants, we can solve some issues, but not everything. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know whether Shruti is here and can uh, can maybe ask the question. Um, if if not, I can I can read it out. Um, Shruti. No. Um, it's um, it's really a remark. I belong to uh, Chandiga city, uh, which has been named the green city. Uh, but I know in reality, it doesn't live up to the name or the image. Um, uh, the great infrastructure uh, here is so prominent uh, that it just take only a little rain for the roads to be flooded. Um, so uh, Chandiga can be the face of urban flooding despite the eminent green cover throughout the city. So maybe nature-based solutions need to be seen more than superficial solutions as problems may be more deep-rooted um, in the infrastructure of the city. Yes, so uh, this is the main issue um, in several countries where we use the word, ah, it's a green city. Um, for example, Bristol, that they want the um, they won several awards, the Green Capital Award. Um, in some areas, especially in the um, in the city center, the the tree cover is really low. So, so we are in it's about 10, uh, 12 percent. Uh, so um, policymakers uh, like to use this word that we are green. Uh, but I think we um, we need to we we need to think that we need to double the the tree cover in cities. We need to implement a nature-based solution. Uh, so if you are thinking about the climate change, uh, flooding, uh, we need to use such solution that are uh, solution that can save uh they can you know can uh can improve our daily life can so uh, this is um, as i said in, in one of my first slides we need to inform policy makers even uh, city managers uh so with the uh, um, modeling studies we can uh, show them that implementing nature-based solution, we can reduce several risks, for example, uh, floods, for example, water runoff or pollutants. Uh, for this reason, I like uh, modeling because somehow we can inform uh, city manager and policy makers. Uh, but the main issue is that uh, uh, we should use a common language between policymakers and uh, people in academia. I don't know how many policymakers are familiar with uh, all this concept that we saw today. So nature-based solution, green infrastructure. So people that like to use this word that we don't like landscape architect, they say landscaping all the time. Everything is landscaping. So. Uh, we are not just talking about landscaping, we are talking in a, a wide approach to solve all these societal challenges. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Chris, would you like to ask your question on the social benefits? Yes, thank you, Katrina. And thank you, Alessio. Really um, interesting uh, aspect here. So um, my question was, um, have you looked into the social benefits of um, nature-based solutions? So these are solutions often put where people live. Um, so is this a something which they fully participate in? I, I think we know the you, know, you talked about the benefits of being in green space. Um, is there additional benefits from doing the nature-based solution? Uh, and sort of linked to that is how how are these features managed in the longer term? So who's responsible for making sure they remain effective um, in the intended outcomes? 
Yes, so I have, uh, thank you, Chris. So I have seen in very interesting question. So um, I have, yes, yeah, several master students that are looking um, green infrastructure, nature-based solution and ecosystem services from also a social uh, point of view. And this is somehow related to what I said before that uh, people don't know the world of what are ecosystem services. So in academia, uh, we, we all, I think also my students, the majority of people know what are ecosystem services or what are the uh, base nature so solution. So uh, people don't realize the benefits of uh, uh, nature-based solution uh, because uh, is the yeah this is, is about the education so it's communication between academia and people so we are the the people that we should inform them and the other barrier is uh, that we are publishing uh, peer review papers and people are not uh, uh, reading peer review papers um, also uh, policy makers and um, city managers. Yes, there are some reports that are available online, but people are busy. So talking also people in practice, they say, no, we are too busy to, to analyze, uh, to read uh, such uh, papers. So my understanding that uh, we should first inform uh, people with the benefits of for example, now we have this seminar, but in this seminar, I think there are only experts in this field. So we should uh, involve more um, our community. And so, so if we involve uh, more our community, this this is uh, so this could be our responsibility to make sure that. Uh, uh, people receive and uh, will appreciate social benefits and at the same time we can uh, inform uh, policy makers and then the always the issue is about money so to implement nature based solution yes we need you know we need to invest a uh, sort of money so for this reason uh, some tools that can somehow calculate the the cultural benefits of uh, uh, nature-based solution or the health benefits are very important to inform uh, city managers. Uh, yeah, to inform city managers of the benefits of uh, of such uh, approaches. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, and maybe it's it's more a sort of a remark and and perhaps a, a question is that you know it was a great point that local participation and uh, neighborhood um, management is important um, could be a good focus for municipal uh, PES maybe for the future. Yeah, um, so I, I, I think. Yeah, we need uh, more involvement with um, our communities to yeah to inform about this benefit of green infrastructure. So that there are also you know uh, several groups, uh, you know, group, Facebook groups where they are teaching about the benefits of being with um, in contact with nature. Uh, the the issue is that not all not all this not if you we think for example I don't know how many uh, I think uh, Chiltern is about hundred thousand people in this in, the, yeah. in this yeah so if we think hundred thousand people then there there are some some organizations some associations for example there is the Pitwill uh, Association uh, Pitwill Park Association yes. and other but if you look at the the number, then you see from 100,000 people, you have just a minority of people that are interested in uh, 
in parks, urban green spaces. So the issue is how we can involve our community. So yes, this could be from the from the municipalities or from the city council that somehow should should create a way uh, a way how we can in, involve people uh, people that can really understand the benefit of being uh, in nature. So before I said about an apple day keeps the doctor away. So if we want to be healthy, we need to be in um, green spaces. We need to engage with the nature. But the, you know, it's easy not to do because we are we we are the also the indoor generation. So we spend the majority of our time indoor, and so it's very important the communication between. Uh, us as as researchers, so we know what are the benefits, but at the same time we must communicate the benefits to to our citizens. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, there are no more questions uh, in the chat. Uh, I'm also aware of the time, but if uh, if anyone would like to ask, if there are any sort of burning questions that you would like to ask in the last um, couple of minutes, then uh, please uh, raise your hands and, and you can ask the questions. And if not, then uh, then really once again, thank you very much, Alessio, for a very interesting presentation and and really thought provoking. Um, uh, I think there is a lot to to think about and and to take in. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you very much. As far as the presentation, um, we will. Um, uh, the presentation will be posted on a YouTube. Uh, please uh, sort of follow uh, the CCRI website. Uh, all the information will be there. We'll try to share the slides on the on the share uh, slide as well. And uh, we're taking a summer break, so there won't be any, any seminar in, in August, but we'll be back with the CCRI seminar series in uh, September. So on the 16th of September, uh, we have a presentation from Dr. Ian Merrill from the Newcastle University, the Center for Rural Economy in Newcastle, speaking about enterprise hubs as a uh, maybe um, a solution for supporting uh, rural businesses. So please uh, follow up the Eventbrite as well as um, the CCRI website and um, have a great summer. Um, and hopefully we'll see you in September. And thank, thank you, you very much. Bye. Bye.